multivariate response data where I mean repeated measures on clusters. So, um, you've, seen, you've seen an example where you can think about this as being repeated measures on clusters with the Beatles example, where you have this clustering that's occurring inside the jars in the binary setting. Uh, but now we're kind of taking a step back to if the purpose of our study was to do multiple repeated measures on the same cluster, unit, individual, what have you, how might we formulate that model? And we're starting with the continuous data case. So um, we can think about specifying first and foremost, which is probably the most important part, part of the process, right, is specifying the scientific question. So it's this linear predictor. So I write this down in one slide and I say, look, you guys have seen this all before, but really, as you well know, there's a lot of work that goes into defining this okay, in terms of thinking about what your problem is and what you're trying to answer. But once that's done, we now have a simple linear predictor like we've been dealing with throughout the class, throughout 210, throughout the class, truly. Um, the hiccup here, of course, is that now we've got this ni by ni sigma that's down here. And so we got to deal with that. I talked a little bit about other things in my horizon, like time dependent confounding. We'll deal with that again a little bit later. But that sigma is going to come into play here, right? Because when I think about estimating those regression model parameters, I've got to think about now estimating their variance as well. And if I were to just throw our good old 210 OLS theory at these things, we're going to have this sigma sitting in the middle of that sandwich for that OLS estimator variance. And that sigma is going to have a form that looks like a block diagonal where I've got sigma 1 down to sigma capital N, those are my number of sampling units. The zeros on the off diagonals are because I have independence between sampling units, okay? And so I'm going to, I'm using that, we're going to use that to our advantage throughout because we're going to borrow information off of those independent sampling units to try and estimate, if you will, a common sigma in, in most cases, or at least the elements. So, we thought about, we can think about weight of these squares if we wanted to as well, as we kind of come up, that was the OLS estimator. Weight of these squares would say, well, try and put some structure on sigma and use that actually to try and estimate those betas as we go through. We're going to talk more about that in lecture six coming up right now, but you guys already have a good intuition behind what's going on there. If I can estimate sigma i for each individual and do that well and use the inverse of that for weighting, then I can gain efficiency. Okay? It's not about bias, it's not about consistency. Getting that from the OLS estimator, but it's about gaining efficiency by ultimately upweighting observations that have low variance, downweighting observations that have high variance. Okay? Very, very intuitive concept. So the question then becomes, you know, as we start thinking about models here, we want to think about, well, what are the possible co-brain structures that we might assume in practice? Again, one possibility is to say assume nothing. Assume that every sampling unit has their own individual sigma i, and all the parameters within sigma i are subject dependent. Okay? And they only depend upon that subject. How far is that going to get you in general? The answer is not very, right? So that's it because it's now you're talking about one observation per parameter effectively, and you're not going to do a very good job at estimation there. So this is the trick you've been playing your whole life. When you went back to 210 the very first day, the reason you assumed homoscedasticity was because you said, I don't want to have to assume or estimate a single variance parameter for every observation that I have. So the OLS model, the theory behind that started by saying, well, I'll assume that they're all the same, and I'll borrow the information off of all. I'll take the sum of squared residuals, divide by n, and I'll use that as a plug-in estimator if I assume that they're all the same. Similar approach that we're doing here. So you're Ron's question, so this is going to be an extremely long answer to a very short question, which is, are there advantages or disadvantages to each of these um, examples that I've given? And, and the answer is, yes, there are advantages and disadvantages to each one. And the examples that I've given right now, to start off with, are just to give you an idea of commonly used designs and models that we have in practice. And they all arise out of the sampling framework that we're using in each of the cases. So the first one, again, was this concept of a repeated measure as ANOVA design, where what I do, just think about it like this. I've got capital G 
G treatment, G treatments ultimately is what I'm going to talk about in just a second. But I take each one of you, I put you guys under one intervention, and I resample you under that same intervention. Um, oh, I'm actually going to go to that one in just a second. So this one is actually I'm going to sample you under multiple interventions. I apologize. I'm going to go to that one in just a second. Now I see you guys each under multiple interventions. I apologize. That's my identity matrix that's sitting here. And so what I can do then is I can borrow from you guys information on whether you tend to be high or low under any particular experimental condition. So think about it as if I had three different blood pressure medications, and I'm going to follow you guys, I'm going to put you on it for one month, and I'll have a washout period, and I'll put you on the next intervention for the next month, I'll have a washout period, and I'll put you on the third intervention. Okay? And I take your blood pressure at the end of each one of those three. Right? So now, I've got three repeated measures on you as an individual. And that means I've got information on where you tend to lie with respect to your blood pressure relative to the rest of your peers. You tend to be high or tend to be low. I've done this with all of you guys. Okay? So I can see who tends to be high on all three of these and who tends to be low on all three. So you guys with me? And so that repeated measures of NOVA design then simply says, well, I'm going to use that information. I will build that into a model through what we call a random effect. Okay? And truly, it's one random effect. Technically, we call it a random intercept, because it really is just talking about you being high versus low relative to the rest of the population. That's what alpha i is here. Okay? If my alpha i is positive, that means I tend to be higher than the grand mean of the rest of the population. If my alpha i is negative, I tend to be lower than the grand mean. Okay? And you can see that that tendency is what's inducing correlation, truly, right? It's because I'm more like myself. I tend to be higher than everybody else. So I am more like myself in my measurements. Okay. So what is the benefit of this you're on in this particular case? The benefit is how many parameters am I estimating inside of that variance covariance structure, right? You could really think about there is a little ni by little ni variance covariance matrix for every subject. But I have boiled this problem down to how many parameters to estimate. Two. Al squared, sigma squared. That's huge data reduction. Um, not to get too philosophical with you guys, but with huge data reduction comes huge responsibility. No, you're making huge assumptions, right? <laughs> Come on, Brian. You gotta give me a little bit of no shape before I even get to the punchline of it, right? Uh, no. I mean, obviously, you're making a strong simplifying assumption here. You're saying I can capture the entire variance covariance structure by simply knowing whether people tend to be high versus low with respect to their mean. Okay, and getting away with estimating two parameters. The next one, then, that I talked about was what we typically will refer to in the literature as a multivariate ANOVA. This is when I started off explaining. I'm jumping a little bit ahead. Now I've got capital G treatments. And for each one of these treatments, now I'm going to just repeatedly measure each sampling unit with inside of that treatment. I'll do that little in times. The key thing here in this particular model when I'm talking about it is by design, I am holding little n to be the same across sampling units. There is no real i on that guy, right? N is constant. Okay? And I'm holding it constant across my capital G treatments. So if you think about it, in the best case scenario, this would be what we refer to as a balanced and complete design. And the reason why I'm saying in the best case scenario is that means I have no missing data. Okay? Mm -hmm. Complete means no missing data. Balanced because I'm measuring each sampling unit a little bit of time, so it's constant across each one of these guys. Okay? I'm measuring each sampling unit the same number of times. Little in times. Uh, well, yeah, I have a question on that. Sure. So if it's balanced, but I have a bunch of NAs, that means that's as good as not measuring it. So I wouldn't, I don't know what's the difference between complete and balanced. Okay. So complete means you have no NAs. In other words, NAs being missingness. Okay? We're using R speed here. Um, complete means that you do not have NAs. Incomplete would mean that there are missing data. We typically, but we use, and, and I, I understand your confusion, you say, well, doesn't that mean that I'm now unbalanced? Yeah. Balance is a design characteristic. By design, I meant to measure everybody little in times. Okay? But it just so happened that I have missing data, and so what I observe at the end of the day are the numbers of measurements. Okay? Good. And that's what 
that's why that's why I bring forward both of those terms when I talk about it. balance and complete. In other words, data are complete. <coughs> what you intended to do was measure everybody who lived in the times. Okay. Good. That's a very good question. And again, I'm not just making up this terminology. This is common terminology. That's why I'm giving it to you guys. This is what is used throughout the literature. Okay. So in that case, because of this balanced and complete nature, I now have equal numbers of measurements, repeated measurements on each subject. That means I can do a lot of borrowing off of people. You guys with me on this? So now if I think about estimating a variance covariance structure for the eye observation. So these are the parameters that are going to go into that variance covariance structure. This is my capital sigma sub i that I've been referring to that's here. Okay. So the multivariate ANOVA design assumes what we call an unstructured variance covariance matrix. And so now what I've got is I've got variances that potentially are different going down my diagonal. And I've got covariances also that are differing. Now they're between the first measurement and the second measurement, the first measurement and the third measurement, etc. as you go. Okay. Now there is still data reduction going on, and we talked about this last time. The data reduction going on is what I have written down here. Those parameters still do not depend upon little i, the sampling means. Again, we already talked about that would be a pretty bad idea. That bring me back to one observation per parameter. And they don't depend upon little g. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm assuming that the variances and covariances are constant under each of those different interventions. Okay. And statistics, it, it's, it's like mathematics, right? It's like climbing up a ladder. You build off of what you know. You build off of the ones that you know. And I brought this up last time. This is the two sample t-tests with equal variances when you come down to two groups, single observation per individual. It will boil right down to that. The assumption there is that the variance remains constant under each of the two interventions, if you will, the two populations. Okay? So that's what I'm doing here. When I'm saying this doesn't depend upon little g, I'm saying that that variance covariance structure remains constant. Okay? A reasonable assumption in general not usually, not in my experience, right? I mean, if you think about, go back to your stat seven days or your stat one on one days, your very first statistics class, right? And think about what the assumption of equal variances is in the two sample people. What you're saying is, I hypothesize that I changed the mean between these two groups, right? With my intervention. But I'm going to condition upon the fact that I do nothing else to any of the other moments. Seem reasonable? Usually not a good idea. I think it was Sasha and I that had a conversation about this in practice. You can almost see it because if you think about just the treatment, right? Take it back to the blood pressure. We all kind of think about blood pressure, right? I give a treatment to one group that's a blood pressure medication trying to lower their blood pressure. The other group, I give them nothing, right? I give them a placebo. I want to see if I can lower the blood pressure with my treatment. Do treatments tend to work? in every individual that we give them to, and then do they tend to work exactly the same in every individual that we give them to? The answer is no, because if they did, everybody here would be unemployed. Right? That's variability. Right? That's what we do for a little. Okay? So what's going to happen is you're going to usually induce variability in the treatment group, because it's going to tend to work in some people and not tend to work in others. And so your distributions tend to look like mixtures of where things are working and where they aren't working. Whereas the other population, everybody looks consistent because you did nothing. And so that right there should try and convince you that, at least intuitively, you're usually, if you're starting to change the first moment, you're going to start changing the second moment as well, the variance. Okay, so going back to your on space though, I am making this assumption because I'm trying to deal with sparseness, if you will, truly, right? Because I've got so many parameters and I've got a few observations. So I'm making this assumption right now. What is going to be our goal in this class? Our goal is going to be to say, okay, well, if I make that assumption and I'm wrong, how do I fix up the variance? You guys already, again, take yourselves back to STAT 101, your very first statistics class. The two sample t tests for equal variances, people learned very, very quickly. That wasn't super robust, so what did they do? Two sample t tests for unequal variances. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science here. I better estimate the two variances separately. Yeah. 
until we're going to fix that back up. So, so the benefit here, Yaron, so if you're talking about pros and cons, a pro is it's unstructured and that I'm not putting assumptions on the variance covariances across the repeated measures, if you will, but where I am putting the assumption on is across the treatments and individuals. Okay? So a pro is that it's more flexible, certainly, than the random intercept model that we just looked at a second ago. A con is that I'm estimating even more parameters to do that. Okay. It's the no free lunch aspect. And going back to Hina's question a minute ago, if I were in an incomplete data case, or if I had an unbalanced design, then this becomes a very dangerous type of variance covariance structure to deal with. The reason why is think about the as the FEB data, right? With asthma. Let's take you back very quickly to that this guy here. For these two individuals that are sitting on the end, where I have nine and ten measurements, their sigma i has dimension nine by nine or ten by ten, respectively. For those individuals, you guys with me? That's how many observations I have on them, okay? And so if I th start thinking about measuring that one comma 10 cell of that variance covariance matrix, how many individuals am I going to be using to estimate that covariance with? In this case, two, right? I've got two individuals that have a first measurement and a 10th measurement, okay? You can see where things are gonna start to break down really, really quickly if you've got an unbalanced design or an incomplete design, okay? So, any case where we tend to start using unstructured covariance matrices, balance and complete types of designs where we can borrow off of everybody to estimate those covariances. Otherwise, you know, you'll see, I'll show you some examples. You can stick these data into R and you can say, I want an, un I want an, an unstructured covariance matrix, and it'll give you back an answer. <laughs> but what it's going to give you back for the ninth or for the tenth individual is it's going to give you the average of two squared residuals for the covariance. Which I don't think you want to hang your hat on, too. Okay. All right. Yes? Um, what's a stronger assumption that, uh, we, that the fact that the variance and variance matrix is dependent on the I or the um, I would argue that really G is what I would say. All right. I mean, so G is really you're intervening on the system and you're changing it marginally. Now, we, we do think about I having different variances across I, but as I condition upon groups, then I want to just, that, that is the goal of measurement there, right, is to account for that heterogeneity across individuals. So there's always going to be a case where you can say, okay, I think Sasha has a different variance from Ben, but I've got one Sasha and I've got one Ben, so I'm not going to do a good job of trying to ask that, right? So, but, so definitely the gene. So the third example, again, these are just three classic examples. We're going to go much more into just kind of general variance covering structures. But the third example I gave was what we call a polynomial growth curve example. And so a polynomial growth curve says, well, let me structure the mean model, say, as a function of, in this case, time, right? This is where I'm measuring my y's. I'm thinking about, if you will, the trajectories of individuals. And so what this is doing then is saying, OK, if I structure my mean model in this way, what I can think about is allowing each subject to have their individual trajectory. So let me actually draw a picture for you guys. Down here, I've got time where I'm measuring folks. And here, I've got my Y, my response. Okay. So you can think about, well, we're putting on a population structure to that mean model. Okay? So I can think about, on average, what do the Ys look like as a function of time? Okay, those are the capital data that I have, not the Ys. This guy here would be 
my marginal mean polynomial. Be like, yeah, I don't think so. I, I think I can have beta 2 be like It'll be okay. I didn't go up all the way on the other side of time. Okay. So now, if I only put on a random intercept assumption, which was the first example that we had, right? The repeated measures that I know about design. I said, okay, the only difference between people and how they relate to one another is some tend to be higher and some tend to be lower. What would that picture look like? What would look like this, right? So I could take one individual, it would have the exact same shape. I tried to make those as parallel as possible, I'm sorry, I'm not, not a very good artist, but okay. So this would be examples of a random intercept model. Okay, so I'm just shifting everybody up and down relative to the population. I'm changing where they start down here if I bring them back to zero. Okay. So that's, as we have seen, a very, very strong simplifying assumption. In other words, I boiled down the variance covariance matrix to two parameters, that tau squared and that sigma squared. In ma, you can actually identify this model in the exact same one, putting a second order trend on it. So what are we actually doing though now with the random trajectories model that I'm talking about. I'm allowing each one of these parameters now to be subject specific, right? You guys with me? So that means I can have situations like this. Right? Or somebody has a completely different shape. I can have situations like positive, some individuals might have beta 2 negative. You guys with me? Because I'm allowing them to vary across individuals. So I'm putting, I'm adding on flexibility to that model relative to the random intercept model. I'm allowing individuals to vary differently. Is there data reduction going on still? Absolutely, because we broke down the variance covariance matrix for that model, and we saw that it looked like x transpose capital E x plus sigma squared times i. Go back to your notes and make sure that you have that, right? decompose it into the within and between subject variances that are sitting there. So these guys here, we would refer to as quote unquote random trajectories. I'm letting, I'm allowing the entire trajectory be random, as opposed to just an intercept. Okay. Okay. And again, this guy here is the population. This is where the population overall sits. Okay. So the pro here relative to a random intercept model you run is that I'm allowing this flexibility. I'm allowing people to have different shapes of curves. The con is, and I think it was Arsini last time, I'll bring up the slide now. I'm still making a very, very big assumption here because what I'm doing is I'm saying if I just condition upon those three parameters that define someone's trajectory, everything else I measure about them becomes independent. Looks like sigma squared i. Okay. So it assumes I'm capturing everything that's latent about that individual, that i cluster, in just that trajectory assumption. You guys with me? So now, there's data reduction that's going on, but it's at least more flexible than the random intercept model than what we had before, okay? All right. So, so those are, again, three classic types of models we might consider. Pros and cons, they all go down to the same pro and con. Increased flexibility, lower information to estimate the model parameters. Try and decrease the flexibility to build the model parameters, more assumptions that you're making about the model. Classic trade-off in statistics. Okay. 
So the in this case, by the way, we did last time for those that aren't here. I think you can check the YouTube or your neighbor and you'll see what the derivation of that guy looks like. Okay. So now let's start about start thinking a little bit more about different correlation models as we go. So any other questions before I actually start moving on? Yes, Stephen. So if you have a lot of data, yep. you don't need to worry about making too much of This is the classic thing in all statistics, exactly. The more data that I have, the more parameters I can estimate in a stable fashion, for lack of a better word, right? So absolutely. Okay. Okay, I can't resist this because you asked. Where does <laughs> can't resist this. Where does having a lot of data not help you at all though? This is the problem with big data age. Okay, so I wanted to point this out. Having a lot of data will still not tell me what this is. In other words, what my scientific question is and how I should be formulating it. Okay. I mean, the classic kind of thing right now that I get from people is, well, I've got a ton of data. Can't you tell me what I want to answer? No, that's not really science work. That's not really science work. You're a scientist. You think about what you want to answer. Use the data to either validate or so, but yes, then conditional upon that, knowing what we want to estimate, Stephen, absolutely. Having a lot of data, that, that's the classic answer from a statistician, right? Get a bigger sample size. <laughs> okay, other questions before I start? Okay, good. So, again, in most cases, this is just taking you back to the 2.10 to 11 days, our scientific interest, for the most part, I will argue, focuses on changes in the mean response over time. In other words, we tend to think about first moments for the most part. Okay? I'm not saying that that's everybody. There are definitely areas and fields where you care about where your true scientific interest is on, say, a second moment or even a third or fourth moment. Okay? A classic example would be in econometrics where you're often wanting to model truly volatility. That's the thing you care about. That's the variance, right? That's the second moment that you're going through there. Um, but largely, I would say, for the most part, if you kind of took um, general surveys across scientific disciplines, we care about trying to estimate that first moment, that mean response as a function of time, primarily. So what that means then is that we can model that via this linear predictor and in the sigma i that we've got, as we've dealt with before, really becomes a secondary interest or generally oftentimes it's really a nuisance parameter. What I mean by a nuisance parameter is you got to deal with it. It's a nuisance that you have to deal with in order to draw inference on the thing you care about. Okay. Um, that's the very untechnical definition, by the way, of a nuisance parameter. Okay. So, if Ni again is large, like Stephen is saying, or if the design is inherently unbalanced, then we might want to put some sort of structure on sigma i. Again, Ni being large means that the dimensions of sigma i are getting big, 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 big. Think about I'm in kids with 10 measurements on the SEV data, and that's 10 by 10. If I would have taken 100 measurements, that's 100 by 100. Okay? And so this goes back to actually another point that I want to make here real quick relative to Steven's question just a second ago. When you're talking about a lot of data, there are two different dimensions of data here and information that I'm getting, right? So I can take one child and measure their FEV a thousand times. Have I gained a lot of information? Trick question. Who do I want to draw inference about? If I really want to draw inference about Johnny, then I have gained a lot of information on John. But oftentimes I care about drawing information on the population of kids like John, right? And so in which case, no, I have I really only gained information on that. So when I was referring to that a minute ago, I was really referring to largely capital gain, the number of samples. Okay. Good. We talked about this before. A true time series would think about little and I getting very, very, very big, but only having one sample. No way to borrow information on those. Okay. 
So now, if we want to impose some sort of structure, well, that's what all three of these designs primarily have been doing. They've been imposing structure in different ways. Okay? They've been formulating it through statistical models to impose that structure. So that's number one here. Each one of those designs that we had there truly was using, utilizing what we call a random effects paradigm. It was very clear on the first and third examples. The first example was putting a random intercept on, allowing people to jump up and down. The third example was putting, allowing for random trajectories, all the parameters inside of that model. Come on. So really, again, there, there are kind of two camps, if you will. There's the random effects camp, and then there's the serial correlation camp, and then there's a hybrid. So let's talk a little bit more about the serial correlation model. You guys have seen some examples of random effects models. Let's talk about the serial correlation model. So, kind of the most, it's not the most general, but the most general that's commonly used, I would say, serial correlation structure or model that we have is what we would call a banded variance covariance matrix or structure. And what I mean by this, there's a couple of things. So one is there is data reduction going on. I've got a common sigma squared here. So in other words, I'm assuming homogeneity of the variance for each observation. Okay? So again, you always think about where you're putting the structure on the model. Where does the term banded come from? The banded aspect of this is coming from the fact that I'm saying, well, the correlation between any two measurements that are one unit apart, if you will, is common the same, right? So as I'm thinking about the correlation between measurement one and measurement two, that's row one. As I'm thinking about the correlation between measurement two and measurement three, that's row one, etc. So I get this banded aspect going down the off diagonals. That's where the name comes from. Okay. Now notice up here, and you guys should underline, highlight, put in quotes, whatever you want to do, this becomes reasonable or more reasonable, I would say, when we have equally spaced measures, okay? Because I'm making an assumption about the timing of those things. So think about the FEV example. If I bring back kids every year on their birthday, I get them back in the office, so I got 365.25 days for every kid, okay? I'm counting for leap years there, right? And so, every time I go through, I'm making a common assumption that as time goes along, there is this common correlation between measurements taken 365.25 days apart from one another. If I do not have sampling by design in that case, and some kids are coming back at nine months, and some kids are coming back at 15 months, well, the correlation between their two adjacent measures might be different, right? Because there's longer periods of time or shorter periods of time between those measurements. You guys with me? So that's what I mean by equally spaced. Okay. All right. So, this is kind of nice, but it still doesn't give us a ton of data reduction. There is data reduction for sure going on here, but not a ton of it. They have a little K down here on each one of those rows. Right. Okay. So, a special case of the banded correlation structure, and probably one of the most common that we have, at least when we have equal space measurements, is to use an exponential correlation structure in this case. And so you can see that what I'm thinking about in building a model like this and assuming a covariance structure like this or a correlation structure is I'm thinking about, okay, well, rho is somewhere between minus one and one, usually positive as we talked about with the folks, right? And so if it's less than one, what this is implying is that as the distance between measurements starts getting larger and larger and larger, the correlation between those two measurements should be kind of going down. Mostly reasonable for us. Um, take your weight. Well, you guys are all still young, so you guys all have the same weight as back in high school. Very much. So, high school weight versus weight at, you know, some ungodly age of like 43. It's not good. It's not good. So the correlation is definitely going down. Uh, in my lecture this morning, so. Good. All right. Okay. Again, here, notice that I'm raising the power here on each of these correlations to just the distance, if you will, between the adjacency of the measures. It's not true distance in terms of time and when those things are measured, but 
let's say, you know, okay, there's a distance of one, if you will, a unit space measure between the first and second measurement, two between the first and third measurement, et cetera. So this is really thinking about unit space measurement, weekly spaces on Jefferson. But what exactly this model would be like technically correct? So do we have do we need to have like a first order Markov chain or something like that? I'm going to show you in just a second exactly how, where the derivation of this type of model comes from in just one second. Right? It comes from a first order dependence upon the last observation of the common correlation structure. Exactly. Right now I'm trying to appeal to intuition first by saying yes. It seems pretty reasonable as time starts growing, correlation starts going down. Okay. But then we'll see kind of where the formula comes from. Uh, I didn't, I didn't clear. Is the, so how we um, like orange the, the distance, like we randomly do the objects or? No, so when I write it down a correlation structure like this, that implies that there is inherent ordering in my observations, my repeated measures. So again, from a longitudinal perspective, we would think about time, right? FEV example, one year, two years, three years, four years out from baseline. Okay? So there is an inherent ordering in the way that Y is ordered going down. Okay? If I were thinking about space here, I might be thinking about Euclidean distance, right? Five miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, as I'm going through deeply space as a function. Okay? Good. So this was Arsini's question. He either forgot his notes or he did not look ahead one slide because this is actually the formulation of it. Um, so let's go ahead and write down and see exactly, make sure that this particular assumption actually leads to the correlation structure that we're talking about previously. But the bottom line here is it's that first order process that was just being described. What I'll do is I'll start with a common variance. In other words, I'll take the variance for the very first, the baseline measure, if you will, to be sigma squared. And then I'll induce a linear model that just simply says, my next measurement depends upon my previous measurement with coefficient rho, right? The correlation between those two measurements, truly. Okay? Plus some measurement error. And then the measurement error that's conditional upon my previous measurement is now going to be sigma squared. You'd expect it to go down, right? Because I'm conditioning upon the previous measurement now. I know a little bit of something about it. It depends upon what that correlation is, how much I know about it. So it's going to be sigma squared times 1 minus rho squared, right? So you can think about as rho is starting to approach 1, if I condition upon my previous measurement, I pretty much know everything about the next measurement that's coming, right? Because they have super high correlation. So the variance of that next measurement conditional upon the last one is getting very, very small, right? So intuitively. Okay. So let's go ahead and write this down, make sure that we're all on the same page about where this would come from. So 
I'm dropping subscripts for you guys, but this is the expectation with respect to yij, right? This is yij plus one given yij. So I'm going to write that expectation down. Just write that down. All right. Well, once I condition upon yij, that guy pops out. It's no longer random inside of there. It becomes constant. So what I'm going to get then is expectation that yij will come out. Well, what's the expectation of yij plus 1 given yij? Well, that's just rho yij, right? Because in my model, epsilon has mean 0. Just taking that expectation through. Similarly, over here, I'm going to get a rho times yij. And then I've got to take the expectation of that yij. So at the end of the day, I'll have a rho expectation of yij quantity squared. Make sure you're getting your seeing that. And so now, pop the row out of each one of these guys. I got expectation of yij squared minus expectation of yij quantity squared. Oh, that looks a lot to me like rho times the variance of yij. And then we've got to deal with, well, what is the variance of yij? So we hope that it comes out to be what? Sigma squared. Sigma squared, right? Constant sigma squared based upon that model that I've written down. So let's make sure that that's the case here. So <laughs> we've already made an assumption to start the model about yi0. We said, OK, the variance of yi0 is sigma squared, right? When I began that process. Now let's take j equal to 1. So if I think about the variance now of yi1, that's going to be the very same old trick of the expectation of yi1 given now step back one in time, yi0, and then plus the expectation of the variance of yi1 given yi0. So now, what I've got is this guy is going to be the variance of, well, this particular model looks like rho yi0. Great. Plus the expectation of, well, the variance of yi1 given yi0, that's going to simply be sigma squared times that 1 minus rho squared. So putting this guy together, then here I'm going to get a rho squared sigma squared, that's by assumption on the model, plus, these are just all parameters here, sigma squared 1 minus rho squared, so I get a rho squared, or a sigma squared that comes out of that guy for yi1. So how are you going to show this for yij? Just make sure that we're getting ready for the fourth one again. Induction. Yeah, induction, right? Did it for 0, did it for 1. Can you remind for a second to work? Uh, so the fact that the variance of y i uh, given the previous observation is sigma squared y one minus rho squared. So where does this come from? This guy here. Yeah. Uh, it's from the model <coughs> setup. I'm gonna let you show it though. Okay, I want you to show it. So it, yes. So you, you can get it right from first principles of that model. Okay, the sigma squared times one minus rho squared. Okay. I want that to be a little bit of a So that's what's going to lead to that. Again, do it for the J case. This is just, by the way, I mean, this is, OK, I won't have you guys do it. That's the assumption, model assumption on epsilon ij. Right? I mean, that's, what that, that's the way the model is forming. OK. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is, I mean, there's a big stationary assumption in here, too, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so how long of sequences are, are typical for like different correlation lengths that you need? Actually, estimate these parameters in these models. Uh, that's a good question, and I'm going to try and address it a little bit later. I kind of want to leave it for just a little while until we actually start getting down to the estimation on the GE side of things. But it's going to take me a while to explain where they come from. I mean, there are rules of thumb, to be quite honest, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you're basically going to be taking sample means across across the program. So it's really going to depend upon the length of the process. So I will come back 
to a rhyme with you allow me to do it in an empirical type of setting, it'll be easier for me to kind of explain the fact that data. Okay. Okay. Good. So now that was in the case of quote unquote unit space measurements. And notice that I'm throwing out terminology for you guys as I'm walking along, right? So this concept of unit space, but also I'm throwing out this concept of an autoregressive structure. In other words, this thing is autoregressive and then it's regressing automatically as a function of time. Think about it like that, right? That's exactly where the terminology comes from. Okay. Well, what happens if you're in the case like the FEB data where not every kid wants to go to the doctor's office on their birthday? So that's not usually going to happen. There's going to be variation in when you measure the FEV on those children as they're marching through time. So in that case, we can think about a continuous time autoregressive process. Oftentimes we will call this an exponential autoregressive process. Again, I'll tell you why that comes about. But the difference here now is that I've got this common row, it's this correlation, and if my unit space in time between any two measurements was one, that's exactly what would reduce down to what I had had before. But now what I'm doing is I'm allowing time to be continuous, if you will, and variable. Okay? So now I'm thinking about as the magnitude of spacing in time is growing larger and larger between observations, then my correlation between those observations is beginning to reduce over time. Okay? So again, we consider this the continuous time or exponential autoregressive process. The reason why that terminology exponential comes into play is because, well, the way I've just written down the model, the covariance between yij and yik looks like sigma squared times rho to the distance between tij and tik. When it comes down to actually writing down these models and then estimating model parameters, we will often re-parameterize this guy into something that looks like sigma squared times e to the minus, I'll call it theta in this case, distance between tij and tik. So just a transformation of that model. That's where the terminology exponential comes from. Okay. Think about exponential decay of that underlying correlation structure. So now, question for you guys sitting down here, right? So if I write down this correlation structure, as tij and tik are becoming arbitrarily close to one another, what is happening to the correlation here between two observations? It is becoming one. What is the implication? I'll come right back to you real fast. Uh, maybe it's relevant before I get to this question. No, that's not for Oh, you're going to answer. Okay, so Arsenio, oh, he wants to take it on all by himself. Okay, I was going to throw it out. Just to figure it out. Okay, go ahead, Arsenio. What, so what is no measurement noise? It means no measurement there, right? It means that if I were able to measure the same subject twice at the same, or the same, the same subject twice at the exact same time, I get back the exact same answer. And no measurement there whatsoever. Often not a reasonable assumption to make. Okay? There is usually inherent measurement error in the device, usually, that you're using to measure something. Take the blood pressure example, right? You guys ever repeatedly measure your blood pressure, like measure right now, measure five seconds from now? Like, it'll bounce around, like five, five units usually, milligrams of mercury, right? So it's gonna bounce. Now that's not at the exact same time. I know, I'm, I'm not done yet, I'm not done yet. I don't live in the counterfactual world, so I don't get to see my blood pressure measured at the exact same time. But you wouldn't expect your blood pressure to be changing super fast over a couple of seconds. Unless you just learn the reason, like like me, I look at my blood pressure result and I go, oh my god, and my blood pressure spikes again because my blood pressure is so high. But, you know. um, but other than that, you wouldn't expect it to change that much. Okay? But again, it means that there is no inherent measurement error inside of that process, and that can be a pretty big assumption as you're going through. And so, for that reason. Some folks have said, well, maybe you want to consider something that's like a hybrid correlation structure, right? So you've got this kind of autoregressive process that's going down in a correlation through time. Let's think about an extinction of the model where we can consider a hybrid between two approaches. Yeah? Why do we worry about TI1B versus TI2? Uh, in general, that's 
that's usually going to be the case, but the idea is if the model holds, the model should hold, right? I mean, as TI1 and TI2 are coming together, do I actually know the correlation should be of one? Right. So we often will think about, if you will, the boundaries to say is the model reasonable. Yes? Can you absorb the measurement error in a single square? Give me a second here. Give me a second. We're going to build some models around that. So the measurement error in this particular problem, so there is a common sigma squared there, but I'm assuming that the correlation between the two observations is one. Right? That model is assuming it's one as I approach TI1 minus TI2 getting going to zero. So I would assume no measurement error at that point. So that's where this hybrid concept is going to come into play. So what some folks have proposed is something like so. They said, well, if I think about the response vector for the I sampling unit, maybe I can decompose that into what I'll call a sigma 1 and then a sigma 2. Have you guys seen any variance covariance structures where you don't have this dissipation that comes about? Yep. That's not nice for this one, but <laughs> okay. uh, so. So what about the situation of the growth uh, spurt? So for example, um, like in some period, kids just grow faster than in some other periods. Would it like completely break our model? Because uh, like presumably the correlation between the years before and after this spurt is probably lower actually than between other years. So how bad it is? It would unless you're adjusting for where they are in that growth spurt time, right? If I had a marker for it. So one reasonable marker we might use might be age and gender, right? Because so the growth spurts are going to depend upon age and gender in kids. And so that'll take care of a large portion of when marginally those growth spurts are going to occur. But you're right. That probably isn't going to take care of all of it, right? Just age, knowing their baseline age when I started following them and then having the time that I went out for those individuals and their gender probably isn't going to tell me exactly when Susie starts puberty and when Jenny starts puberty, right? And so there's going to be some residual that's going to be changing there where it's not going to be a common correlation across those two individuals, right? So it would be depending upon a hot and technically at that point. Everything that you're saying is exactly right, and it's going to, it's all kind of pushing to why we're going to start off with a basic assumption. We're going to try and get as reasonable as we might be able to. And then we better start thinking about, and what do we do, realizing that we're wrong. Everything that I'm talking about here are simplifying assumptions on the variance covering structure. I mean, it's what we've been doing all along, but it's, again, it's on steroids, to use my quote from last time. They're just bigger and bigger assumptions that allow us to do data reduction. And that's why I've been trying to push you guys to think about robustness when you're wrong on these assumptions. So you're absolutely correct that these are not going to necessarily be captured. So, in the vein of trying to get as close to as possible and not thinking that measurement error doesn't exist in my reality, because it usually does, okay? One thing I can do here for the autoregressive to try and fix it up is to try and build in, again, some sort of a hybrid where I'm going to have, if you will, a decomposition of the covariance where in the first part I'll allow for correlation to exist regardless of what time I've measured. And then the other one being autoregressive, where I account for the fact that measurements on two units farther apart should actually go down the correlation. Okay. So the question is, is have we seen a variance covariance structure where we have existing correlation regardless of how long I've actually measured individuals? I 
given you guys two names for it in the past. Compound symmetric is one, and the other is exchangeable. Right? That row one is constant across any, any points in the line. Okay? So it's saying that that row one is there and it's going to exist. I don't care how far I go out. It's just a common correlation between two measurements taken in time. Okay? And then we can think about oops, a sigma two squared. Where now I put on my continuous auto regression structure. So it's T1, Ti1, minus Ti2, and then finally a row to the Ti1 minus Ti, say, in. Now I have this hybrid context, right, where I've got common correlation that's going to exist no matter what as long as row 1 is not 0 and then I've got a regressive process that says, yeah, and then the additive correlation to that should be dissipating as a function of time. Yes, right. Are these identifiable? Are row 1 and row 2 identifiable under this model? Depends on the sampling structure, but generally yes. Okay, I mean, in other words, if I've got stochastically measured times over they are going to, and we're going to see a special case of it that's probably ubiquitous model in literature where we can estimate these things. I have a related question. So, uh, does the like, time unit matter? Sorry. Like, like the unit of time, does it matter in this case? The unit of time certainly is going to affect whatever row true estimate is going to be, right? I mean, as I'm going through. So, if I'm talking about measuring blood pressure in nanoseconds apart versus years apart, going to be quite a bit different. I mean, that's what my row estimate would be, so absolutely. But it's scale, scale or price? It's going to be scale. scale. Exactly. It's yeah. going to be scale. And i got to assume that I'm, I'm, I'm keeping that scale constant right across the division. Absolutely. Okay. So this thing we'll call sigma 2. And so let's just look really quickly at that model. So in this particular case, I look at the variance of, say, yij. So just a single unit, of course, what I'm going to get is that's going to be sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared. And then if I look at the covariance between two measurements, say, yij and yik, that guy is going to look like a row 1 sigma 1 squared. That's coming from the first component plus a row 2 to the tij minus tik times a sigma 2 squared coming from the second component of that mixture. And so then if I look at the correlation between yij and yik, well, that's just going to be the covariance divided by the variance. That's constant across observations. That's just going to be a good old row 1, sigma 1 squared, plus a row 2, tij minus tik, sigma 2 squared, all divided by a sigma 1 squared plus a sigma 2 squared. And so, We think about then what's the correlation between, say, measurements taken at the same time, or at least arbitrarily close in time as we're pushing towards zero. Ti j minus Tik that distance go down to zero, 
plus a sigma 2 squared all over a sigma 1 squared plus a sigma 2 squared. And again, this will be less than 1 provided that row 1 is less than 1. Again, if I allow row 1 to be 1, then that's just simply saying everything's going to come back and I'm going to get the there again. Okay. But the other aspect here is also, if we think about Tij minus Tik going off towards infinity, well, what would the autoregressive process tell me if I just had the continuous autoregressive process? It would say rho is going to zero, right? Which means that if I take a long enough time span out and measuring myself repeatedly, I'm going to start looking independent. So like I'm taking another draw just from the population. In other words, there's no residual correlation within myself. Okay. Again, not often reasonable. In other words, there's often kind of a steady state among individuals. They're going to tend to be high or they're going to tend to be low. Okay. So if we think about this particular hybrid model as Ti day minus T. I, sorry, K goes off to infinity. Then the correlation between measurements is going to be a row 1, sigma 1 squared, all divided by a sigma 1 squared plus a sigma 2 squared, which is going to be greater than 0, again, if row 1 is greater than so in other words, you've got this kind of common correlation that's going to exist no matter how far you go out or how close you come in. Okay. And so I would argue that this in practice is generally a lot more of a reasonable assumption that you might want to be making. In other words, the same sampling unit as you're going out is still going to be that same sampling unit. It's not going to look independent relative to the rest of the population. So, you know, part of it, uh, and I'll go through this a little bit more, Brian, but going back to your question on identifiability, part of it is you're going to use some tricks, right? So you're going to estimate the overall variation sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared, and you're going to kind of come back and get a, 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 an estimate of each one individually by subtracting off, basically. Yes, Kit? Uh, would you do something between row 1 and row 2? Between row 1 and row 2? Yeah, well, row 1 is, again, I mean, they're, they're both relevant correlation components, right, between two measurements that are spaced across. Row 1 is saying I've got this common correlation that exists. I don't care if I've measured a nanosecond apart between the same, on the same unit, or if it's 100 years. Okay. So that's the row 1 component of it. The row 2 is kind of additive on top of that and says, as I start approaching down towards zero, that correlation should start to rise between those observations. And as I start going to that 100 years, that should start to coming down. Okay, so it's just, a, again, a simplified assumption where I'm assuming it's just this additive component between the two. That's so if we focus on one object, like if we start having to focus what now? Uh, if we just focus on one object, so... Yeah, one sampling unit? Yeah, it's like what we do here. Exactly. So time series basically says, so what we're going to see soon is that if I'm going to try and estimate these model parameters, I'm going to start to take averages across my independent sampling units to try and estimate these guys all the way across. Okay. That's, the, that's the reasonable thing to do, right? You want to estimate a single parameter or something that's common across sampling units, they're independent, I'll average over them. Time series would be saying if I'm going to assume something like this, I've only got one sampling unit to be able to do that on. And so therefore, what you've got to do is base your assumptions on your model and then try and detrain the data relative to those assumptions. And then get quote unquote pseudo independence to try and estimate those parameters. Good. 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 All right. So far so good? Okay. Yes. Yep. So you touched on this a bit earlier. Yeah. Um, the TI1 minus TI2. Shouldn't there be like some kind of scaling coefficient? Uh, you said that the time gets scaled. It's going to get sunk into row two here. 
So the answer is yeah, you could have a scale. If I change oh, yeah, the scale, yeah, okay. I can think I about having a scale that would go down, but I can also sync that to on the scale. Yeah, yeah, it gets exactly. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Alright. So now I want to just kind of end off at least this lecture before we go on to six. Where we're going to think about estimation with the now that we realize we have to make all these assumptions in the longitudinal data setting, it better be worth something at the end of the day, right? And so let's think about what we get out of going through all this hassle of trying to estimate these correlation and covariance components. And so let's think a little bit about cross-sectional and longitudinal effects. And really what I'm doing is, you know, kind of gone through a little bit of the covariance structures that we might be considering as we go through time, but I'm, I'm taking you now back to the mean model at the end back to the scientific portion of the question oftentimes. Saying, and what is the bang for the buck that we get? Right? So, in the growth curve example, what we had assumed there was basically that all the measurements occurred at the exact same times, the TJs, right? So I had this balanced design in that growth curve example that, that gave me this kind of nice rise to the, a common design matrix across each subject in a particular study. So that would be, for example, saying that they all had the same age and baseline if you're thinking about growth rate of kids, right? So everybody has the exact same correlation or uh, design matrix. One thing that we can do and one thing we can see, I'm going to use ages and people right now as an example, but this extends outside of this. But to give you guys an idea of what you gain, if you will, from the longitudinal sampling framework, is think about a study where you are actually measuring, say, kids at different ages, right? And you're taking measurements at different facial times. So that's exactly, by the way, the FEV example that I started off with. Those kids come in, they're different ages, from age 8 to 18, and then I'm measuring them in a stochastic fashion over time, okay? So in other words, just random as to when they come in. I try and time it around a year, but there's going to be plus or minus some variation, okay? Well, those types of designs really give us opportunity, and they give us opportunities that allow us to think about what is the cross-sectional effect that you're aging in my example on FEV versus the within-subject cohort effect, okay, or within-subject time effect. It's due to aging in that process. And so, a classic example where you can kind of see the payoff of this, I'm going to draw a picture for you guys right now, but where and colleagues back in 1990, they were one of the first ones to kind of put forward some of this. And they were looking at lung function again, they were looking at FEV1. They were doing it in kids with cystic fibrosis at the time. And so, this is what they had found when they looked at their data. So, cystic fibrosis is a disease where the lungs kind of start to shut down. And so it gets gradually worse and worse for kids, right? So you can think about all of us, when you guys were like age to 18, for the most part, we were kind of growing and our lung function was getting better and better and better as we grew, okay? Or as we were getting bigger, okay? So we were able to have, we were able to expel more, um, more in one second. Okay. So, Cystic fibrosis kind of tends to work a little bit differently. And so you might think that actually as somebody is getting older, their disease might be progressing and their lung function might actually be getting worse. And so if you plot out though, just cohort data in these kids, and again, this is one specific example to get, try and give you guys context. But it certainly extrapolates to many other areas you'll see something that looks like so. I'm kind of drawing this, uh, it's a little bit idealized, but not too far. And so down here at the bottom I have H, and then here I have FEV. And so if you imagine just plotting this on a plot and saying, okay, I want to estimate the cross-sectional effect of age, and you fit, well that's supposed to be a line, but you fit an OLS line through that guy. You'd see something like that, right? 
I'm going to talk about that in just a second, right? So if I just plotted the data, I didn't tell you what subjects everything pertained to. Just yet, okay? I just looked at the cross-sectional effect of age. You'd say that as these kids are growing in age, their FGD is getting higher. But then, going back to Hina's question, if I say that's subject one, and that's subject two, and that's subject three, and that's subject four, that's the difference between the cross-sectional effect of aging in these kids and the within-subject effect of aging in those kids. Do you guys see that? I mean, it, it doesn't get any more striking than something like that, right? The difference between a cross-sectional estimate and a within-subject estimate. So the answer, Hina, is even if I had randomly sampled kids across different ages, I'd probably have a similar picture. I drew it here to where I was clustering with inside of the kid. But if I just take one observation from kids, I'll see a similar type of picture. Why might I see that in a case where I have a chronic lung disease like this? This is an example of chronic lung disease. If I put this over here and I say, okay, this is age 35 years, and this over here is zero years of age. Who am I measuring if I were to randomly sample out uh, here at age 28 or 30? I'm measuring adults, that's one. Yeah, and I think that Maricela is, is she, she, she's silently saying it's one. Well, I'm saying survivors. What was that? Survivors. Exactly. So when I'm out here and measuring this person that's 28 years of age and pulling their FED, there's somebody that has lived and had good enough lung function to live to age 28. You guys with me? Whereas when I'm over here and I'm taking a random sample of kids, some of those kids won't actually make it to age 28 or 35, right? Okay. So you might see this cross-sectional effect of aging. That's what we call the cross -section. That's marginally. That is what the average FED is among those kids that are, say, are adults now, that are 35 at this point, and the average FEV among these kids here. But when you look within the subject, their lung function is actually continually going down as a function of time, okay? You guys with me on that? The decomposition of these things? Okay, good. So now think about the particular study design that we had, that I just talked about, where you now have a study design like our FEV example that I started off the class with, where kids come in at different ages, there's variation in their ages, but then we also have repeated measures on those individuals. Well, can we use that to our advantage to tease apart both the cross-sectional effect of age, sorry, that guy, and the within-subject effect of age, okay? And the answer is absolutely. You should be able to do it, and you can actually do it in a very nice simultaneous fashion if you've got that type of study. Because both of them are relevant questions, but they're answering very different things. Again, you know, both are relating age to the two very, very different domains. So if I'm in that case, you could think about, well, I could build a cross-sectional model. This goes back to Hina's question just a second ago. What I could do is I could say, well, I'm going to take the first FEV measure on each kid that I have. Right? And if I did that, I would have independent data. And I could say, okay, I'm going to relate that to their age at the time that I measured it, the very first time. That's your good old 210 days, right? That's a, that's a linear regression model that's sitting up there. I put a little beta C on there because, again, that's the cross-sectional effect of what age would be. Okay? It's averaging across the population. This is why I counted you guys with interpretations, talking about comparing across subpopulations. Okay? This is exactly why. That's what we're doing here. Well, I can also fit a longitudinal <coughs> model, right? I could say, how does your FEV change as you grow in age? This is my first FEV measure to my J FEV measure. So that's the within subject change in FEV. How does that relate to a change in your age? That's the within subject effect of aging. Okay, if I age three years, on average, my FEV goes up by delta, whatever that might be. And so, you guys can write this particular boy down, but we can simultaneously estimate both of those. And that's the beauty of this model, right? I can say, ah, now I've got repeated measures on YIJ. 
I can think about what is the cross-sectional effect if I just take the first measure on each individual on how that affects EIJ, the expectation of say FBB. And then I can also say in the difference as I age within myself, how is that going to change my FBB as I grow through time? And so now that model would allow us to answer both of those questions. That's just one example of kind of the, the, the benefit that we're going to get from having to deal with all these correlation structures, right? You can decompose between subject and within subject covariate effects. Very, very nice. So convince yourself that these two models can be written simultaneously to answer this exact question. This one's a little different, right? Because I'm talking about a difference of things, right? Convince yourself that you get the same interpretation that's coming up. Okay. So we will pick up next time by thinking about estimation. We're going to go at it from weighted least squares, and we're going to talk about estimating model parameters. And then we're going to know what the question are any rate is basically, which is to say, all these models are idealized, we're probably wrong. What's the result that they need to do? Okay. If you guys, uh, you know what?